we could be running a little late. But I just want to thank God for the vision that he has for us in this church. Um, every day it seems like he is just opening my heart and my mind to understand more about his vision and what God has in store for us. And as a prayer team, we have an awesome opportunity to touch so many people's lives. And to, we are a big part of this church. And I just want to encourage you just to keep on keeping on. Because God is continually using us. And the fact that we've got the seminar going is awesome. The teachings, the, our first seminar was awesome. Um, Brother Phil facilitated that and taught and and I know that we are going to continue to grow in his name. Um, tonight, my prayer is that we are going to grow deeper in our prayer life. And when we surrender completely to God in prayer, spiritual warfare are fought and won. Amen. Now I would like to introduce our member of the prayer team, Brother McManus. Thank you, Sister Shouse. It's so good to be here tonight. I know it's Friday evening. Perhaps you'd be eating out right now, or eating at home, taking a nap. I think I maybe I would have been taking a nap. I think I think that's the option I would have taken. But I am uh, very thankful for what the Lord is doing in our church. I'm thankful for what He's doing. Uh, more importantly in our lives individually. I feel, I don't know if you feel what I feel, but I feel God drawing. I don't think, I mean, I, I am so, let me first of all say, I am so thankful for a pastor, one that we can trust. And we know he hears the voice of God. He's listening, he's searching, he's going to the mountaintop, he's coming down with direction. And I am so, so appreciative of that. But I am also just as well thankful for each and every one of you here tonight that he is not having to grab your ear and make you conform or be obedient, but you have a desire in your heart and you are hungry to know God in a more powerful way than before. I want to try to be um, sensitive to the Spirit tonight as we talk about this because I feel just as Phil mentioned last time, I was not here, but I did get the audio as we begin to listen to it, this is so, so expansive when you're talking about spiritual warfare. So what I am not going to try to do is try to um, answer every question that you may have ever had in your life uh, or that you may ever have in your whole life in that way that you don't ever have a question because I am not God, first of all. I'm not ever here to replace, I, we, we don't believe in idolatry, okay? And I also want to say, let me just state this, that I do not know everything. I am trying my best to learn more about him and his ways. I am simply just a soldier. I, I do not feel as though I'm a high-ranking soldier. I don't feel like that I have any commanding in that regards, except that I have a desire to know the Lord and to follow his word. And I know who is on my side. But I, I want to, uh, I'd like to start tonight. We'll look at Ezekiel chapter 37. I think it's just so fitting as I began to pray about this. You know, you fast, you do all these things in preparation. But ultimately, it's God that determines what we need to talk about. And I felt the imagery. This is one of my favorite passages of scriptures in the entire Bible because of the imagery, but because of the the type and shadow of this, 
we won't have time to, to read through all of this. I'm going to focus in on, we'll probably start with verse 10. Um, but just so you know, this is where Ezekiel was carried up into the spirit and he was set in the midst of the valley, which was full of dry bones. And there are many things that we could talk about. There's reasons why these bones were dry. And when you began to think about they were scattered, they were sun bleached, they were uh, more than likely half uh, deteriorated. Some of it had been gnawed on. There was no um, order to these bones. There was no resemblance of what it was. No one could look at it and say, you know what, I know what this was. It, all you saw was bones. Now, it brings up many questions, and again, we can't go into it. I have studied this because I love this passage, but there's a question of why are the bones not buried, and, and you go into it and you understand the enemy. It was kind of a um, this just a really rebellion against these people not even the decency of burying them they're just they're on top of the earth and I know that this resembles and we know the scripture gives us interpretation and that's the best as we understand here just in a second but I also want to just tie in so as we look at this I want you to Put yourself and insert yourself with this. I feel that all of us at some point, whether in the past, presently, or sometime in the future, you will feel as though that's where you are. Your dreams are like this valley. I mean, everything that you could ever hope and, and, and grasp at. However, here is God shows up. Now, the, the similarities when you look at this and the prophesying and the coming together and the unification of the bones coming together and there's a great sound of shaking, and then there is the, the wind that comes and brings life. This is Acts chapter 2. You begin to go back and forth, back and forth, and what we're about to read, you can't deny it. This is Acts chapter 2. The unification, uh, the bringing together, the sound of, of a rushing mighty wind, the life coming, this, Acts chapter 2, so... I want you to be aware this is you. This is me, okay? Because we're, we're still living in the book of Acts, all right? You following? So here it is, uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 10. So I prophesied, and he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army, an exceeding great great army and then he said to me son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel this person like this these bones represent the the whole land of Indianapolis these bones represent fallen warriors along the way in the Bible church these bones represent even people that are faithful to my house but yet internally they are full of dead men's bones let's just put it where it's at on the outside, there's life, but internally, when I see it, I, I do not even see a glimpse of where I've called them and where they will be as I began to speak life. These bones represents an army. That our, because the whole house of Israel, they've said, hey, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. This is speaking of hopeless people. We're cut off from our parts. Therefore, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your grave this is a promise for you this is a promise for me so no matter where you are right now you may feel like well you don't know who you're talking to I don't I haven't I don't even feel like I'm really you know Jesus said you know thief cometh to steal to kill and to destroy John 10 10 but I've come to give life and life more abundantly I, I don't feel like that I'm at life yet more or less life more abundantly I pretty certain I feel like the thief is still still stealing and he's still killing and I feel like he's trying to destroy it. that's why this is important and we'll, we'll talk about this so in other words we're all equal here we're all called to be warriors and God is doing the work he is breathing he is prophesying through our pastor and I love this this is amazing and there's others that he's raising up and it's these others are not speaking a voice that's not our pastor no 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 <laughs> These are, these are those that are beginning to hear. That, these are you tonight that are hearing 
the voice of the pastor because the, the pastor has already gone on top of the mountaintop. We don't have to question. We don't have to wonder, well, when will God speak? I'll tell you when he speaks. He speaks every single service. Now, of course, he speaks every day if you open your ears and listen. He's speaking to you expressly. And if you can't hear, then it's, it's kind of amazing because he can get to you with just your eyes. If you'll just read his word, he'll get you. So even if you can't hear his voice, no excuse because he can... And even if you can't see and you can't hear yet, you might be dead like these bones. The Lord knows how to get you. I'm just trying to, in a, in a slight way, even prophetically here, listen, there is an army that's rising up, I, you know, <laughs> to break every chain, you know. There, this is where we're at. This is spiritual warfare. So the question could be, is there spiritual warfare? Or we could ask it another way. Do we ever come under attack? Is it possible that we could be under attack and not know that we're under attack? Now, there's a, an important one. Now, this is going to go a little deep, and then we'll jump back and won't go back in there for now. But, but there, look back and think about it as God allows you to think about this. Hasn't there been times you did not know and recognize? But just because you hadn't grown to that point of discernment, you were being just bombarded. Spiritual warfare, I mean, it was just landmines everywhere. You, you see through your eyes. You're walking by sight, not, not by faith. You're not trying to say what's going on. And so uh, there's all these things. But now we can begin to look at the Scripture and what the Scripture has for us. We are, there is spiritual warfare that's going on every day of our life at all times. There's never a moment that it's, that it's not going on. And God can teach us. God can definitely, definitely teach us about it. Um, let's look at it. Um, I know that most of you are like, okay, well, let's get this one out of the way so that we won't have to, like, be thinking, trying to get ahead of you. Let's do that. Ephesians chapter 6. I know that's, you know, you're like, oh, let's please go there because uh, I know that's the only thing that we can find in the Word of God. It's the only passage that talks about spiritual warfare, of course, right? Not, not, not. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a second. I like to use hum humor because um, it helps me feel calm. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I'll read it amplified, classic. If we we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending with only physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the ru world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural spirit. Now, we don't have time tonight to extract all this, but hopefully you realize this. And if not, then you... You can do a little bit of research. These are very, these are not like synonyms. These are not like he's just saying the same thing, and he didn't really have a better way of saying something, and he's just getting a little evangelistic. So the Holy Spirit's not directing him on this one. We know that's he, the Holy Spirit is directing him to say each and every one of these. And you research these. These are various levels of authorities and rulers, really of regions is what this is about. He's defining this. Now, you, this, all, this language here is King James language. And if you go back, it, it made, they understood what it mean. It would be the same as if I, you know, said, uh, you know, there are certain, certainly uh, mayors and there are governors and senates and there's vice presidents and there's presidents. And then there are one world rulers eventually at some point. We would get that immediately. We're like, okay, geographically, regionally, that's what he's talking about. It's the acknowledgement that there is, the further out you go, and there's plenty, plenty references to this in the Scripture, even with Jesus, when he was speaking to legions, and they were like, please, don't send us, don't send us to another region. Please, don't send us. Why? Why? Because they had an established dominion in that region. They didn't want to be sent into another a region where they would have lost their influence and their power. They're, and you research it. It's there. Trust me. So, Sometimes we lose sight of this, and, and here's what I mean by that, a discernment. If God doesn't help to open our eyes, even in a, a family dynamic, 
even in a family dynamic, there, things can seem like just a turn, and, and now there's irritation, there's like friction, and you're like, I don't even know what just happened here. This doesn't even make sense because we're like off, you know? Like we're not working. We should be happy right now. But there's like some stuff. Has that ever happened in your house? Like you just don't even understand, and like things are coming out, and people are saying stuff, and are you, are you serious? Like how am I supposed to stay in the spirit, you know? I'm about to get in the Robert spirit right now, you know. Um, and it actually, actually took me a long time, and, and I was just, just ignorant, okay. But God began to reveal to me, and it challenged my spirit. And I, I just, I didn't, I didn't, again, I read these scriptures, and oh, this is just a good, you know, Ephesians 6. I, I got that mastered years ago. But when God began to reveal this to me, and, and, and so I was new at it. I never tried this before. But I remember the first time, and, and of course, you know, I understand family dynamic. It's not all, t- all the time spiritual things, but more times than you would, could ever imagine if the opportunity is given. But I remember the first time, I, I, w- I couldn't believe it. I felt like I was about to lose my mind at a particular moment, and I don't even know why. I mean, just, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm just being honest here, so if you don't what, like this, I, I'm so sorry okay but like I'm struggling with like a little bit of anger and and I don't that's just that's like my old old way but nothing of I mean I I have a little bit more control but I'm feeling like anger like I could tell because it's a little little edgy and it's like man this is this is not right my spirit's not right so so I'm just gonna test this out God began to talk to me and I'm like I'm in the laundry room and I'm okay and I felt a challenge why don't you why don't you just try it why don't you just try it so i be okay father right now in the name of jesus christ and by the authority of the word of god i curse and i bind every way of darkness you're not welcome in my home and i release the peace of god and the joy of god and any irritation and agitation i curse you leave right now that's all i mean i didn't sit there and i mean there are times that I mean, I might go a little further than that if nobody can hear me. I go out of the laundry room. What just happened? Uh, where's that cloud? Where, where's all this love coming from? Where's this, like, humility coming from? Because that was not in here. And, I, and, again, I'm not perfect here. I still... Like, don't get it through my head, okay? So let's just be honest here, all right? I still don't make that connection that I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood. But it's amazing. I'm telling you, more times you could ever imagine. We see, we see the visible, but we got to acknowledge the invisible. We have to. I have, uh, I have at this point, God has even opened my mind a lot more and talking about regionally and you get outside of the United States, I've had a lot of opportunities now with various friends and family members and what have you. And it's opened my eyes even when I travel now. I realize, okay, if I'm leaving from my domain, my, my city, if I'm leaving from my state, I've got to be aware of this. I don't care if I'm just going one state over. I don't care if I'm going two states. It, it never dawned on me. I never, I'm telling you, I never put, made the connection. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this. We're going we're gonna to declare God's dominion and his covering and protection before we even leave our house. And of course, we've always uh, tried to do that. Uh, um, just just seemed like the right thing. But, but specifically, Father, we know we're going to be traveling into different regions. But we also know that you're sovereign over all regions. None of them are beyond. And uh, I don't think it's by accident that all of a sudden, not only is there just there's peace, there's peace, there's peace, there's, there's all this stuff. But then while we're away, God will begin to, whether it's through dreams or whatever it is, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm on vacation, but God is given some crazy stuff right here. And I've been able to minister. I mean, we're on vacation. You're supposed to, like, check out from church, right? Not. Okay. You don't, you don't do that, right? Okay. As a soldier, for him, you never or a non-soldier, you're always in the war, and you can try that, 
Try that. Try to go out there and say, you know what? I'm not putting on my armor, which we'll talk in a second. I'm just going to like, I don't want to fight anymore. So you know what? White flag. Let's see how the enemy responds in warfare tactics. Let's see if that's, they've got some type of international code. Let's just see. Yeah, you, you're going to be slapped upside the head spiritually. Oh, yeah. You're going to be spinning. You're going to be wondering, where did my peace go? Where did, where did my direction go today? Why is the day ending and I feel like I am in turmoil? I, I, feel, I feel like I need to get away or something. I don't know. So we, we have to go there. And it commands us to, to put on God's complete armor. I'm reading that amplified. So I, let me acknowledge that. And I know we've done this before. But again, this is not just like your armor. I'm going to put on my armor today. No, your armor is not going to cut it. It's God's armor, okay? So, so we're to put on the whole armor so that we're able to resist and stand our ground on the evil day and of danger and having done all the crisis de uh, demands to stand firmly in place. Stand therefore and hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins and having put on the breastplate of integrity and moral rectitude and right standing with God and having shot our feet in preparation to face the enemy and the firm-footed stability the promptness the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel peace and lift up over all the covering shield of saving faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword that the spirit wields which is the word of God now it doesn't go without, you know, we have to uh, make this point, I guess, just so we understand. I know this is imagery, and I know that this is spiritual application, but you you got to realize, and we'll get this in a second, but this is also, so when it's talking about uh, you know, breastplate of righteousness, it's not talking about an external facade, and somehow you can have righteousness covering you, and that's all. No, it's actually talking about completeness of righteousness. So, in, in other words, what is, what is the breastplate covering? It's covering your heart. So, getting sucked into ritual and routines is not where it's at, okay? You're going to be way better off if you understand what it's talking about. Righteousness has to get down into your heart. This is really a sp spiritual warfare. Therefore, it's talking about the spiritual man. It's not just your body. We're talking about the heart. So somehow God has got to impregnate your heart with righteousness, and that's going to protect you and to keep you. Somehow truth has got to, to gird you and to strengthen you and to give you protection. Somehow salvation is more than just an external protection like a cute little hat on Easter, okay? It's not that. It's actually, it's got to, salvation's got to go on in the brain. Logically, God's got, I understand that it starts off here, and then it gets here, and then eventually it comes here. So in the brain, in the heart, and then out the mouth, because out of the, the mouth, the, the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's that progression, so it's got to start somewhere. But your, your mind does have to be sanctified. A, a cute little scripture or just a quotation of a scripture only doesn't do it, okay? So it's not, it's not like... You know, if you put this armor on, this scripture on, then you are the best soldier ever. Can I say this and you don't take offense? If you are a bad soldier, the armor won't matter. This is internal stuff. This is stuff where it's an old-fashioned word, and this is kind of stuff that God, like, gets me every day. It's this old word that we don't like, and i got to say it quietly. It's this old word, holiness, with that which no man will see the Lord. It's that. It's the purity of the heart. It's the purity of the actions. Because I can tell you right now, it does not matter what you pray if your life doesn't line up with your prayers. Did you know that you can have all the faith you want, which I've been guilty. You can have faith in prayer, have faith in prayer, have faith in prayer. But yet when you get into real life, you don't even recognize it, but your mouth betrays you. It speaks the very opposite of what you were saying in prayer. And therefore it cancels out all of your prayer. 
But you would be amazed if you can have tremendous faith and begin to speak as God begins to come on your spirit. But then your faith won't be checked out here at church. God will not be confined to a building or you will not confine God to a book. But God, all of a sudden, he is inside of you. And when he's inside of you, now your faith goes with you. And so even when you're discussing with your spouse, even when you're discussing with people at work, again, the human nature is, you know, it's the Roman 8, 6. You know, the mind of the flesh is death. But the mind of the spirit is peace. It's soul peace and, and, and eternal life. So you see this contrast. So it's extremely important they match. And I, I think that one gets overlooked in spiritual warfare often. I, I, I'm, just here, I'm just being transparent. I'm just giving you examples. If you don't struggle with that, if you don't have any challenge with, with saying one thing in prayer, but when you really take inventory of your words and your actions outside of your prayer, if they match up perfectly, awesome. But the reality is God begins to, to, to cause us to become a greater soldier in his armor. He, army, he will challenge you that your words do matter because that's where it actually begins to be put into practice. That's where the war is really being fought. It's when the opposition actually comes later on that day and you have a moment to speak unto that situation by your belief system. But if your belief system all of a sudden says things of doubt, worry, all these other various things, and it can go long list. I'm not just focusing just on those, but those are pretty big. Everything you said prior to that, it just, sorry, it, it canceled out. And so and then you become frustrated. But when we believe in God, not just in prayer, but when we believe in God in our life and we go, we are able. We are able to be an army. Because you've got to understand, and we'll, we'll mention this just in a moment. We'll get to this in a second. But this is not about you somehow defeating all the enemy in your own strength. It's not by might it's not by power but it's by his spirit it, it's it's not the battle is not yours really the war is not in fact if you if you need encouragement today okay listen you are enlisted into the army go ahead read revelations read revelations the war is already won now i know it's going to unfold and i know that we've got to see but truthfully when Jesus said, it is finished on Calvary, it was not just like, oh, good. Everything up to this point, I got it. Yes, it's finished. No. You got to understand, when he said, it is finished, man, he's looking at, at the expanse of all eternity. He knew everything. He knew every mistake you would ever make. He knew everything. There is nothing that blindsides him like, oh, wow, I thought I knew that think I would have held off from calling them. No, 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 no. That's why the gift and calling of God are without repentance. Why? Because he enlisted you, but he also has the power to, to, to bring you to the place to do his warfare for him. There's many things I'd like to say. Let me, let me just say this. Uh, let's look at Isaiah 54. I want to use a verse that we don't normally like to use but we'll use it anyway. We like verse 17. We don't like verse 16 very much because that brings more context because it brings up an in interesting question because it says, behold, I have, this is the Lord speak, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I have created the, the waster to destroy. God said, I created that. But then he gives a promise with it. No weapon that the person that I created forms against you. It shall not prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall not condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. That's us. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. In other words, I want to just want to just make this point. The Lord is the creator of all of our enemies. Don't you think he's also the creator of all of our victories? Because when you start thinking about that, if he's the creator, now that doesn't make sense at first because you don't want him to be the creator of your enemies. Like, you know, malicious people, evil men. 
Well, guess what? Do you know what the greatest enemy of yourself uh, is? It's, it's yourself. When you look in the mirror, that is your greatest. He created you. But he won't even allow that. That's, that's his whole power in working in us. He won't even allow that if we submit to his will. Because as we know, and, and again, a whole other passage, but we, uh, if we submit ourselves unto God, then we're able to resist the devil and he will flee if we submit ourselves to God. Now, I know we've already made reference to this, but again, this goes right. It's not just God, but it's all of God's authority. And you cannot submit to God if you don't submit to your pastor. I know everybody here is in agreement. I'm just, just making that. You should be emboldened by that. It was a revelation to me years ago. I didn't, I didn't get taught this in Bible school. They didn't teach you. They taught you ethics, but they didn't teach you that if you were underneath a man of God, if, if another man asked you to come speak or preach it there, that you should, you should politely, um, I, you know, that sounds great to me. If you don't mind, will you please contact my pastor because I'm underneath his authority. Will you please get the okay? And then when the okay is like, absolutely, let's go. Let's, let's get this taken care of. Nobody ever taught me that, and I actually learned by observation. Thank goodness it wasn't my mistake, but I watched someone make that mistake and never told uh, the pastor, and I was, I, it was the, the heart of the pastor and his, his breaking. I couldn't believe it was like it disturbed him greatly that, that he would not be asked and invited, and he taught me then. He taught me then that, hey, listen, if you, I know it seems like a small thing, but if you will do this, then, then the anointing that, that flows first from the head, and I know you know this, the, the anointing always flows from the head down. If you want the anointing of God, you'll be underneath the head of your life. God places a, a pastor in your life for a reason. It starts with him, but it flows downward. Unity of the brethren is like the oil. It's when you come into unity of, of uh, your others, but also underneath the authority of the pastor. But I, I, I remember distinctively, and ever since, and this is no joke. I remember the first time that I, I was sheepishly asked the, the, the pastor, because uh, I felt ignorant at this point because I had a very good connection. I actually, man, there's just so much. But I was like, you know, I still need you. I need you to, and I'm like, oh, okay. And it wasn't because, it was just because of our relationship. We, it was like family. And I'm out of state. But I remember, like, sure, I'll do it. Calls. I remember the, the anointing. I mean, when I stepped up to the pulpit, that, that was different. I felt like I was feeling what my pastor, I, I could only, that's the only way I can explain it. I felt like the mantle of my pastor rest on my shoulders. I mean, my composure changed. I, I wasn't even prepared. I wasn't even at that point. But, but what I'm talking about is submission, submitting to God, submitting to authority. And from there, that's when we even began to resist the devil and understanding that God is is on our side. He's the creator of all of our enemies, and therefore, he also has our victories already plotted and planned and figured out. So you don't have to worry about that. I just want to mention that. You don't have to worry about losing. If you will follow, see, you've got to follow the will of God. You've got to listen to his voice. You've got to seek him daily. Seek for his instructions. Don't tell me that he won't answer you. Don't tell me that. Do not tell me that. Him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, E-T-H, modern language is, is saying, I-N-G, continually, to the church. God is always speaking. You've got to be on the right channel. You can be, he can be speaking wrong channel like, you know, the old walkie-talkies or whatever, you know, different channel. and You're not saying anything. Get on the right channel. Oh, there it is clearly. I, I hear what you're saying. You got to change channels, and God is speaking, and He will speak to you, and He'll speak to you by other people. You might miss it. So, just a little plug for being interactive in a service or at any point, be attentive because God's voice might might use the man of God, might use pastors. Say one little phrase, and you're like, "Whoa, that was my answer to my prayer. That's my instructions." It might be through, I mean, so many ways. It might be in your dreams. I mean, there's so many ways God can speak. So, spiritual warfare. Are we doing okay so far? We're going too fast. Everybody with me? Okay.
let's, uh, let's connect this to Isaiah 59. I'd like to connect Ephesians 6, 12 through 18 that we read to Isaiah 59. And I realize that you know, we, we perhaps won't get to everything tonight, but I, I want to try my best to, to be sensitive here as we look. Isaiah 59, uh, verse 16 and 17. Now this is a, I believe this is scripture. Yes, it is. This is what I want. God, the whole chapter is like God searching and looking for judgment. He's looking for action. He's looking for people to make spiritual warfare. Again, things happen. We could say, oh, our world is so wicked. The world, world, it's all physical, but it's not. It's not. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. There's, it's a spiritual warfare. And if we, we do nothing, we don't fight, well, then the enemy wins. But when God's spirit begins to raise up an army, If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31. Who, who, who's who's going to stand up against you? If the battle's not ours, it's the Lord's. He's already got it figured out. we just got to be obedient here. All right, so finally, God gets so frustrated. And this is actually where Ephesians 6 comes in together. And I just want to show you something here. I want to look at the action of God, but the attitude of God. Okay, that's really what I want to see. And he saw there was no man and wondered that there is no intercessor. Therefore, his, his arm, his power, brought salvation to him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now, I know this latter part does not get added into Ephesians 6. That's why I want to add this, because it's not just the actions we're talking about. Of course, it starts internally. We can't cancel out what we're, we're professing ex externally by what's going on internally. But once we get that straight, we've got to understand God has given us the tools and the armor that, that we need. Um, in fact, later on, you read, Paul making the alludement to the armor of light. Um, we put on this armor, but it's the attitude. It's the, it's the vengeance. And this vengeance is referring to uh, the, what's, what's to be right. It, it's, it's the zeal. When it talks about zeal, it's talking about uh, just that overwhelming passion of seeing that, that okay. I mean, seriously, it's, it would be no different than if you're home. And you're sitting there in the comfort of your home, and someone breaks in to your house right there while you're sitting there. How, how responsible would that be for you to do nothing? I mean, think about it. If, if you, I mean, I know we'd be afraid, of course, or something, but, but if you really knew that, that well, your, your kids are, are, are away or, or your spouse is, I mean, truthfully, when you think about the dynamic there, when there, there, there's a reaction, there's, we're already programmed that way. It's the fight or flight. In that point, we probably would fight. We'd say, wait a minute, you need to get out right now. Whatever we would have to do. And that's kind of, I, f I feel like that's where we are. God is leading us all into the, the spirit realm. It's because there's principles, and we can't bring this up or talk about this at this moment. There are principles in the Old Testament that when you are silent and you do nothing, it equals consent. When you do nothing, automatically, according to the 613 laws that the Jewish people follow, that's consent. You didn't do anything. You said nothing about it. Okay, immediately, you consented to it. So we've got to be extremely careful that we don't pass judgment upon our own selves in spiritual warfare. Does that make sense? Like God looks and he tries to, to weigh right from wrong and he searches for, for a man or woman, of course, that will do something, that will, will rise to the occasion and says, wait a minute, no, 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 no. You ain't, not in my house, not in my church, 
Not in my community. Not in my city. No way. Not in my state. No, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about, the zeal of the Lord, the vengeance, which means, you know, it, again, it's just, it's not just sitting back and like, well, I guess there's really not much we can do. It's just the way the world is now. Yeah, that's exactly how darkness conquers. Turn the lights off, yes. Yeah, if there's no light, yes, you're right, you're right. But darkness can't win as long as the light's on. Cannot. It's, there is no such thing as darkness if there's light can't exist okay so we just have to allow god to put his supernatural spirit so i'd like to connect this to ezekiel 22 i know you probably are connecting all this together already but we're about to make a turn and finish this off on a couple of things we just read that god was searching for somebody to to make intercession is what we just read in Isaiah 59. But when we read Ezekiel, Ezekiel has a little bit different take. The very last part, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap that would take on spiritual warfare, not let this thing just fall apart before the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Nobody. My power was able to, to do it. My authority, I have all authority, heaven and earth. I gave access to everything needed, but no man stood up. Therefore, I have I poured out my indignation upon them, and I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. In other words, God's still looking for someone to make. You, do, you, do you understand? I mean, I, I, it's, intercession is, is part of that. It's not like we're just going, like, looking for a fight. Like, oh, yeah, come on, devil, where are you at? It's not like that. It's not like that. We may feel that way sometimes. It's not like that. Yeah. Seriously, it's, it's, it's you got to understand that it's being led by the Spirit. You're walking by faith, not by sight. And you're actually looking at people. You're looking at people and, and the effect of the enemy. That, and, and sometimes those people are in your own home. Sometimes those people are yourself. You recognize, wait a minute, there's a spiritual war going on. But then there's many times other, that other people that can't, they just, they're not able at that moment to fight. And God says, okay, my spirit's upon you. Just like it was with Samson, the spirit of the Lord would come upon him. They, they couldn't figure out where his strength came. It wasn't his muscles, or they would have, they would have made that connection. It was something that they could not distinguish on the exterior it was something that, that confounded them, but when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he had supernatural strength. That's what we're talking about. There are many, many things that naturally we can't do it. Yep, you're right. No way. Can't defeat that one. That's too high. But when God's Spirit, we become like David. How much, besides the lion and the bear, how much fighting and warfare did David have at that moment when he went to his brethren, and he heard Goliath. How many men had he killed? Is it recorded in Scripture that he had killed at that point? Oh, so he wasn't qualified. He hadn't killed any. So he wasn't, David, don't do that. No wonder his brother, brothers were so upset with him. Don't, don't you say that. You're not trained in it. But did it really matter when vengeance was the Lord's, when the zeal of the Lord got a hold of him and he said, who is this that's defying who is this? I mean, there was something that I, I believe it was the Spirit of the Lord that got a hold of him. He said, no, 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 no. In fact, we know that. You, you come with me. You come with me all these things, you know, your, your spear, your, you know, your sword. Um, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. He was making it plain. It's not my, it has nothing. It, this is just an external thing. But God was guiding. I know he was accurate and he'd already practiced, but God wrought a tremendous victory and that's what we're talking about we're not talking about just small little minor skirt you know like there's oh yeah that was a little little small demon and like wow i'm feeling good and i leveled up i'm level two now no we're talking god is saying no 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 my power my authority in fact let's just look uh I don't want to wear this scripture out, but First uh, Chronicles 
29. First Chronicles 29 and verse 11. Because I think this is important. When we recognize this. Thine, yours, O God, is the greatness. Thine. Thine, O God, is the power. Notice this. And the glory. Watch this. What does it say? And the victory. Thine is the victory. And the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. all. We, this is the same Jesus that said in Matthew 28, all power in heaven and in earth, they've been given unto me. This is the same one that we see Paul talking about in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, talking about Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible, notice this, and invisible. It'd be some if he said, oh, that which is natural and that's it. He didn't say that. He said that which is natural and that it, which is supernatural, he created it all. Notice what he says. Whether they be thrones, our dominions, our principalities, our powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is the one that created all things, even our enemies, but he also has all of our victories. He has all of our victories. He's already got it figured out. Yes, ma'am. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians 1, 16. All right, we're going to move on here. Let me just address this before, in case I forget. Can I just clue you in on, let's look at, a, um, is it okay if I use some more scriptures? Okay, because we're about to use some scriptures. All right. <laughs> Exodus 15, 3, just so we can lay this uh, foundation. 15, 3. One of my mentors is not so uh, short-winded, and he rubs off on me sometimes. Exodus 15, verse 3. <laughs> the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, that don't even make sense. The Lord, I mean, capital L-O-R-D, the Lord God, the self-existing one, the only true wise God, the God. He is what? <laughs> He's a man of war. Only God can be that, like that. All right, so let's look at, um, well, we'll, we'll do uh, Psalms 24, verse 8. Because this, this one some of you know this from me, and this is what I do sometimes. It's just a little tip, okay? Sometimes when I don't know what to say, this is what I say. I say, right now, I release the God of Psalms 24. This is what I, I and specifically verse 8, but right now, I release the God of Psalm 24 to come right now. The reason why I do that, you can read through it, but I'm verse 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He's never lost. He's 100% victorious. Never lost, ever, and never will. He will never lose. So if you are on his side, you will not lose. We lose when we fall short from his direction, his word. When we don't listen, that's when we, when we lose. Let's face it, it's not his fault. He didn't lose. He didn't mess up. I can assure you that. God's never messed up like that. Mm -mm. No way. He didn't do that. No. He wasn't in the dark. He, he had the answer the whole time. All right, let's look at Psalm chapter uh, 1, verse, I'm sorry, Psalm 144, verse 1. I should just use it for my memory here. It'd be easier. Psalms 144. Be 
honest, I don't even know if I have everything written down properly. I just kind of make notes, you know. And <laughs> this is the instructions here. Blessed be the Lord, my, uh, the Lord my strength. Notice this. Which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. This is a scripture. This is a scripture that you should circle and that you should start implementing into your prayer. God, you are my strength. Lord, you are my strength. You teach my hands to war. This is talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat. He gives us the ability to fight in the war. He teaches us. We already read that he is a man of war, and God will teach us to go into battle. So if you don't know how to do it, guess what? You've got the greatest teacher of all. You've got the Lord himself, which teacheth my hands to war. But notice, and my fingers to fight. What is he saying in there? What is he saying? It's referring to a bow. You research this out. It's talking about the pulling back of a bow, the whole motion, especially when you look at the Hebrew. It is the pulling back motion of the fingers. In other words, I'm going to teach you how to do face-to-face -face close combat. I'm going to teach you how to be a master at fighting. So it doesn't matter if you've lost in the past. This is an encouragement to you, by the way. It doesn't matter what the enemy's done to you in the past. That's all irrelevant. That's in the past. But let me tell you something. You let God start to transform you and download into your spirit how to go into war. I'm going to tell you what. The Lord knows how to win. The Lord knows how to win, and he'll teach you to win. He'll teach you to war properly. But God will grow you to a place that you won't have to always be when you have to be right in it. God will teach you long-range warfare. That's what the, the bow is. God will start begin to speak to you. He'll begin to give you a word. Before it even comes your way, you can cancel that out. It never come to fruition. Yes, he will, and he does. Yes, he will, and he does. He'll bring it. It's prepare to meet it, so defeat it, as some say. Prepare to meet it, so defeat it. If you're prepared for it, you see him coming, done. Sorry, you're not getting any closer taking you out now. That's what we're talking about, my fingers to fight. That's when God begins to put it in your spirit in prayer, and you're like, okay, I don't understand this, but okay, God, teach me how to do it because I don't need it to get any closer. I don't need it to come to, to do some type of damage to people I love. They might not get me, but it gets somebody I love. No, no, no. You don't, you're not going to get anywhere close anymore. So it's, it's both of those, all right? So when God begins to talk to you, you got to realize he's teaching you, preparing you to meet it so that you can defeat it. Don't ignore those disturbing dreams, those ones that shake you, that causes you to, it's so real. I can't, I don't even know what was that. That's so real. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to always. If it's from, from God, he will, give you, he will give you the interpretation. He will give you the interpretation. In fact, if you, if you feel that God may speak to you in dreams, the best thing you could do is before you go to bed at night, God, take control of all of my dreams, every single one of my dreams. They're all under your authority. None, none that shouldn't be there. They, they don't come into my mind. And then from there, Lord, help me to remember. Help me to remember the dreams that you give me. And then obviously from there, you know, what? <laughs> help me to be able to interpret this. Like, what does it mean? Like, what does that, God, what does this mean? Don't, like, you know, it's like a vending machine. Like, wow, well, he he didn't answer in 25-minute prayer. That's a long time for me. Fast. When you talk about warfare, add fasting to it. And I'm not, I don't say that like throwing that at you. No way. I'm just saying there are some things that do not come out except by prayer and fasting. I think that's a trick of the enemy, all these modern translations. There's some things that do not come out by prayer is what it says. Leaves off and fasting. Oh, oh, the disciples weren't praying before then. They couldn't cast out the devils. They weren't praying. So they're, oh, yeah, that was a great revelation. Uh-huh. Yeah, a trick of the enemy is my opinion. If you eliminate it, if you, if you disrupt the recipe, you don't get the result that is needed. But when you follow the full recipe, when you follow the word of God, then you can expect it to come to fruition. 
Okay. I know we're running out of time here. I just want to be sensitive here. Let's, let's look at, we've alluded to this, but I, I feel we definitely need to touch this. Uh, John chapter 14, talking about spiritual warfare. We're talking about intercession. Again, if, if for any way our words in prayer are canceled out by, by our words in our own life, that's one way that the enemy can frustrate us and frustrate even the plan of God. He's like, I gave you victory and you had it. How did you lose it? Well, because you're Cuban and you need God to help you. That's the reason, okay? So we don't beat ourselves up because there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So there's no condemnation here. So hopefully you understand. Everything we're talking about is love, the love of God. And man, he loves us greatly. Even when we fail, have you ever failed God? <laughs> Thank the Lord that he loves us. But this is extremely important. Um, John chapter 14. We'll, we'll wind up stopping here because there's no way we can go through the rest of it. It would uh, be too much. Anybody like to buy me a cup of coffee, I would finish this uh, statement. So just throwing that out there sometime in the future. If you'd like to hear part two, I, just buy me a cup of coffee and I can, I've got, nah. We, we want to be obedient to the, the time frame. All right, so John chapter 14, Jesus makes the statement. I'm going to read this in the Amplified uh, Classic, the AMPC, because the Classic is more literal and it uses the brackets appropriately. The Revised, a, just the Amplified, well, let's more paraphrase. I mean, it's pretty standardized, um, weak and diluted new translations. So if we look at this, I will not um, talk with you much more. For the prince, the evil genius, ruler of the world is coming. He's talking about Satan, okay, the enemy of our soul. Verse 30, sorry, John 30, John chapter 14, verse 30, AMPC. Watch this. Watch what this says. And he has no claim on me. He has no claim. He, watch these brackets. This is just a little further ex, explanation because it's there. If you want to dig it out, it's, it's in the original language, so it's not like we're like, oh, yeah. What, he has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. Oh, my goodness. Are you getting that? Did you hear that? He's making, he's like, He's coming, but he has no influence over me. He has nothing. He's talking about there, there's nothing in me that he's left. There's no deposited previous experience because we all have done this. We have experiences. Brother Mitchell mentioned about this just a couple Sundays ago about how we interpret things by our experience. This happens to us all. But if we're not careful, those experiences will cause even certain insecurities. These are deposits that the enemy will place into our spirit. They will cause us to fear at certain times. Not always, but they're there. They are, they are access to the, Jesus said he doesn't have access to anything in me. He has no influence. He has no control over me. This is like the right of way. If you look at land, and I know we see right of way or, or passageway when, we, when we're driving, but when you look at a lot of laws, they talk, you can own, you can own 100 acres, but in the middle of those 100 acres, somebody owns one acre. By, by right, they have to have a right-of-way. They've got to have a way to get to their property. You can't say, sorry, <laughs> you want to sell me your property? I'll buy it. I'll have 100. No, you can't. You have to give them a right-of-way. You've got to give them, and that's exactly what the enemy looks for. He looks for experiences. He looks for occasions, uh, occasions that we get hurt, occasions that, that causes us to, we're injured, we're wounded, we failed. 
all of those various things. I mean, you could go down the list. It's there. And the enemy finds a way to get a backdoor key. And he has a right away. That means at any point in your life, he can, he can insert himself. You're doing so great. I mean, you have made so much progress. But one day, I mean, you find that he has shown up and that God's grace will allow you to have a flesh check. That's the grace of God. You should be thankful for it. You should thank God that he would allow you not to be deceived. God shows up and you're like, I have no clue why I'm talking that way. Where is this attitude coming from? God's grace is allowing it to be revealed so that you can be humble, be human, acknowledge your wrongdoing, but also ask God, Lord, and this is why we're, we're talking about this passage. We began to ask because Jesus went on to say, but Satan is coming and I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know and be convinced that I love the Father and that I only do what the Father has instructed me to do. I act in full agreement with his orders. In other words, we've got to get to this place where the enemy no longer has access into our family, into our personal lives at any time. I'm like, we're doing so good. That's how he can derail revival. Comes right in, he's like, oh, I'm not worried. I've got a hidden key. It's always there. They've never, they've never changed locks. I've got it. Because that right there has always been there. They're always going to be sucked into it. I can always get them. And that's what he will use. And he'll have a right of way to go right into your spirit. And he's got you began to swirl and your head is spinning and you begin to have doubt. You begin to have old fears. You begin to have old struggles start to creep back. Because I'm telling you, we're talking, we're, again, we're talking about spiritual warfare, but we cannot have strong spiritual warfare if we have weak warriors. I speak from experience. I speak from experience. You know, we feel good, but we've got to have God to be able to do a greater work. I'm telling you, God has done phenomenal work in my life, and he's not done. I'm still praying this because I don't want there to be any occasion. I, I want to be more like Jesus. Just put it where it's at because I know he wins every battle. He wins every... All the enemy has been put under his feet if we had the time. And I've got a lot of stuff we could look in Ephesians. But I will add this one, um, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. I just want to connect this one. We'll finish with this. Romans 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Don't you remember where this is at? This is in Genesis. Oh, my. This is Genesis. Mm. Wow. You, you remember your seed shall bruise his. Oh. Wow. There's, there's a lot there. Jesus did that, you know, when he was on the cross. When you bruise your heel, you don't. It's not like you completely injure it forever. It's bruised. It hurts for a little while, but then it heals itself, right? Do you remember he was, he was bruised, he was injured on the cross, three days go by, and he raises again. But guess what? You are the church. There's only one head. That's why we got to be in unity. That's why we got to be under submission to God and to our pastor. Because when we get that alignment into our spirit and mind, our heart says, I know I'm not perfect. Can I just say that right there w would take us a long way in spiritual warfare? Because what you do when you say that, you humble yourself and you all of a sudden allow the grace of God to come settle on you and then you have the power of God. And I've got a lot that we could talk about. I, I'm telling you a lot when it comes to the grace of God. I'm, there, there are some very deep things. So when you become honest and transparent, say, God, I, I don't have it all figured out. In fact, I'm not, a, I'm not the best warrior yet. And that's where I'm at. Like, I can't say I'm ignorant can't say I'm ignorant because I've God has taught me some but I'm not a master at it and I need his strength and I need more of his grace I need more of his power to teach me because I'm gonna tell you what I want to defeat the enemy I want to destroy his stronghold I, do, I don't like it it's not appropriate to me let's just put it that way I don't like it it's 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 not it's not gonna happen 
I'm not going to allow this to have ruin without me just sit there and let it happen. No way. No, I know what I feel in my heart. I know what I sense in the spirit. I know what I see in your heart. I can see it in your eyes. You know what I'm talking about? There, there is an army that's rising up and breaking every chain. And that's what happens. It's a multiplication. You deliver this person, now they're a warrior. This person gets set free and now they're ready to fight. And before you know it, I mean, I'm telling you, pastor's talking about it. Our minds can't even, just like it says in, in Isaiah, that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are way. And I'm telling you, multiplication blow, will blow our mind. Lowest form of multiplication is one. So we go from 124 to 153, whatever the number is. We'll stay where we are. But the next number, multiple is two. Immediately, we're done. We're over 300. We can't, we can't no longer have one service for sure at that point. That's small numbers. That's like if God wasn't involved. Can I just say that? God gets involved and does his multiplication. Done. Done. This is a small group setting. Sorry. Yeah, this is a nice little section. We'll have uh, a lot of classes to, for the community here. That's what this will be. There's no way, not a congregation, because God's multiplication, that's what he did on the day of Pentecost. 120. Oh, 3,000. That wasn't a multiple of two, by the way. That's God's math. That's how he works. Shall Bruce, Satan, what? under your feet all things have been put under Christ's feet we're part of the body so guess what it's now under our feet Jesus said I, I give you the power to tread upon you know scorpions and serpents and over what over all of the power of the enemy does that sound like failure to, to you does that sound like that he didn't leave the church equipped enough? No, no. I'm telling you, God has equipped us. We can do tremendous work. But it starts with a genuineness, an approach. I know I said that I would just use one verse, but I just... I know that we're past time. All right, I'm just, because rarely does this one ever get put in context. I don't know if I've ever heard it in context. I'm just being honest. Maybe I'm just too new at it. But generally speaking, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This is just something God challenged me with a while back. Context is important to me because I feel like you get actually what it means. <laughs> I don't like anybody to take my words and twist them to say something I didn't say. That's the way I feel. I feel very passionate about that. I think you can get distortion. You can get definitely not the truth. And actually hurtful things can happen. If someone cuts out and edits, it happens all the time in the media. I, I feel even a higher responsibility when I look at the Word of God. I really do. Why should I extract one verse to, and I've had, I'll be honest, there's been some passages I've not thrown away because I accept all of, but I don't use it like people use them. Like if you really looked at that verse, that doesn't even mean what we're talking about it means. And so the Word of God can challenge you. But when we look at, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read the preceding verses. Because usually we're just at verse 11, and it says, we are not ignorant of his devices, Satan's devices. That's what, how it gets quoted. Can I read verse 9 and 10, and we'll stop here. For to this end, also I did write, uh, Paul speaking, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Watch this. <laughs> this is wow. To whom you forgive anything... I forgive also if I for, forgave anything to whom I forgave it. You, your sakes, forgave it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. This goes into what we're talking about in John chapter 14. 
It goes into the right of way or passage to our heart. This goes into if we're canceling out and there's the conflict of our words in prayer and our words, our real life. Forgiveness. The whole concept is about forgiveness. Because if we're not careful, that's how the, the enemy can get advantage over us. Forgiveness. There's such a temptation many times to hold on because that's our control. We're like, ah. yeah, but you don't know what they said. You don't know what they did. I'm sorry, you don't know the context, and I'm just using that word again here just in a way that someone could say it. But yet the command is we don't allow the enemy to have access to our spirit by holding on to things. Because when you hold on to stuff, do you realize that even the blessing of God, it becomes like the manna that was in the wilderness. You try to hold on to the manna more than it was supposed to be held on to, it turned to worms. The worms would eat it. And when you began to hold on things, even if you're righteous in your beginning, you're like, I know what's right. This is what's right, and I'm holding on to it because I'm holding on to my right. And what's right? You hold on to that and don't give it to God, watch it turn to worms. Watch the enemy gain access to your spirit. Watch it turn to bitterness. Watch those, the building, bitterness, the roots of bitterness, which Hebrews talks about later on. Watch it go so deep. You, it will tear your spirit up. It'll shut you down. With bitter, bitterness, I've, I've seen this across the board. It's bitterness and then callousness. Then you began to want to do something about it, so you began to fight against it. And unfortunately, the enemy knows how to to turn your attention. He gets you, it's a progression to get you off focus and you're fighting, but you're fighting the wrong war. Full circle here, Ephesians 6, you're fighting flesh and blood. You're not fighting the right enemy. And what happens is, unfortunately, this is, man, I feel the spirit right now. Fortunately, he will continue to get you into a mode of fighting to ultimately, and this happens, people begin to fight. They can't fight, they can't see so they turn and they begin to attack the leadership. They begin to attack the pastor. That's why it's important. We've got to make sure that we let go. I'm telling you, I know of some tremendous, tremendous struggles of various people. And I appreciate these people, their, their genuineness of their struggle of letting go of, because of certain things. And, and I get it. I understand when you forgive, that doesn't mean you forget. It doesn't mean that you, like, well, that didn't happen. So, yeah, when I, when I forgot, when I forgave, that just, you know, doesn't mean that at all. Doesn't mean that. It means that you release that influence and that power. It's the John 14. It has no influence over me. The enemy, I forgave, I let go. God is able to heal you. He can do some tremendous, tremendous. And when that happens, listen, when that happens, when we step into warfare, when our heart is right, it's filled with righteousness, when our, when our mind is saved. It's not just a little external helmet of salvation. No, no, my mind is salvation. It's not about a, you know, externalism of what I can portray as truth. No, my spirit is in truth. I will worship God in spirit and in truth. My spirit is in truth. I'm in truth. My, my whole body is in truth, which, which also acknowledges that you continue to be honest and genuine and real, that when you are weak, you are weak. And when you failed him, you failed him. When you struggle with anger or struggle with forgiveness or struggle with whatever mistakes you've made and you can't see past it, you just be honest with him and say, God, I need more grace. I need more Let's stand. Let's finish there. Thank you so much for your attention. Sorry to go so long. I think it would be appropriate for us to pray. We're talking about prayer all this, but I think there's nothing that beats prayer than just prayer. Can I give you a weapon that you can use? Whatever God lead you to, whatever you write down, whatever you highlight, whatever you underline. You need God to give you specific promises and passages, even in warfare, 
that you not only began to declare, like you declare it by reading it, but you've got to learn to begin to claim it. So it's eternalize it. You've got to learn to take it from there and now put yourself and say, okay, God. Your word, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call in me and you will answer and show me great and mighty things that I do not know. And Father, I know you're faithful and I claim, excuse me, I claim that right now in the name of Jesus. And you began to search, you might even research it if God leads you, but you get it and put it into practice. But from there, you've got to transition it to, you began to claim it and begin to thank God, begin to thank God for allowing it to come to pass into your life. So it takes a transition from the word to declaring it over your life to thanking God that it's already come to pass. Now, I know that takes faith, but you mix faith with the word and miracles happen. You mix faith with the word and things that you never thought possible could happen. And the missing piece of the puzzle, you're like, well, I know his word. But you mix faith and begin to thank him for it, and you claim it and personalize it, put your name in it. Miracles start to happen, and I, I am testament to that. Anybody like special prayer? If you'd like, we're going to just uh, end this in prayer, but we're also going to uh, pray if it's okay. Anybody that would like special prayer? Why don't you come towards the front, sister, because this is how we do it. This is how you look at the instructions and look at the word of God and then you just okay that's wow wow she wants to be stronger wants to be stronger and sometimes the enemy really tries to confuse our mind and like causes us to doubt and all this but God's able to answer this prayer request anybody else if you'd like to have special prayer why don't you come let's pray right now
Senator Bortel did was too common, too many occurrences, and so we did it, put it in. And I think that some things that the pastor says is is so common that it's like it's not in there anymore. It's so common that that we're that we won't that it's just a They don't carry the 